The Indiana Dunes area is one of the most biodiverse regions on Earth, and a crucial migration way station. One regal visitor that travels through the dunes on its long journey? The beautiful monarch butterfly. The story of the monarch butterfly is one of incredible transformation and epic travel. The monarch's tale is filled with trials and triumphs. This video will show how each of us can play a key role in the survival of the incredible monarch. It can be as simple as planting a milkweed seed. The story begins with a tiny egg, no bigger than the head of a pin. The female monarch can carry up to 400 of these precious eggs. She will lay only one or two on a single milkweed leaf, repeating the process over and over again on different leaves. The eggs hatch after only four days. The caterpillar that emerges will first eat its own eggshell and then begin to eat milkweed, the only plant they will eat. Since 1976, we've lost almost 90% of our monarch populations. There's a lot of specialist species that only feed on one plant and to create that habitat where that plant is can allow these species to thrive. And once their eggs hatch and the caterpillars come out, that's what they have to feed on. And so it's important that we have places like this, and even in your backyard, you can grow that to help uh, sustain the monarch butterfly. In a matter of only two weeks, they will have grown from a quarter inch to two inches. Soon, an even more remarkable transformation takes place. The caterpillar moves away from the milkweed and finds a sheltered location nearby. There, it sheds its skin and forms a hard protective coating called the chrysalis. Over the next 10 to 12 days, the chrysalis becomes clear and eventually cracks open. At last, the monarch butterfly emerges, head first. The monarch pumps a liquid called meconium through its veins to spread out its small crumpled wings so they can expand and dry. The veins within the wings then stiffen. Only one hour after hatching, the monarch is ready to fly. The adult butterfly no longer chews milkweed leaves. The monarchs now suck the nectar from many different flowers, as well as drink water, through their straw-like tongue called a proboscis. The monarch butterfly flies the farthest of any insect on Earth. Monarchs migrate between 2,000 and 3,000 miles on their trip from the United States and Canada to their winter homes in the forests of Mexico. The monarch populations migrate to a small area in Mexico to spend the winter there. And the monarchs that spend the winter in Mexico aggregate in a, a very small area, and scientists in Mexico measure that area every year. This has been going on for a little more than 20 years. The winter months find the eastern population of monarchs gathering in the Oyamel forests in Mexico. The area is a very small region, about 40 miles wide, with only 12 places offering the rare habitat butterflies need to survive the winter. Monarchs cover the trees while they rest and wait for spring. As many as 15,000 butterflies will crowd together on a single branch. When spring comes, millions of monarchs wake from their dormant state and take off from the trees in the Oyamo forests. But how do they know which way to go? The mechanisms behind that have not been completely worked out, but have been worked out to a degree more so than pretty much any other migratory animal on the planet. So the monarchs are breeding over an area, hundreds of millions of acres, and they're finding an area in central Mexico that is like 20 acres, so hundreds of millions to 20 and they're finding that spot. You know, the monarchs can sense the sun and use the sun as a compass. You know, we're not sure if the monarchs actually have a map sense. It's also known that the monarchs can sense magnetic fields. When they get really close, it's possible that they can actually smell the trees. There's probably a lot of different mechanisms that they're using. The monarch migration cycle starts in the spring, when the first generation of monarchs hatches in the south. These live only two to six weeks as adult butterflies. They will fly north as far as they can, lay their eggs, and die. When the second generation is born, it will continue the journey, stop to lay their eggs, and also die. The process continues through the third and fourth generations, which hatch through the spring and early summer months and at last finish the migration. At the end of the summer, the culminating super generation will hatch. This generation lives for six to nine months, and as temperatures start to drop in the fall, these butterflies head south. This dangerous trip takes the monarchs two months to complete. The monarchs will then rest in the Oyama forests through the winter. Once spring arrives, they will begin their journey north, lay their eggs, and die. When those eggs hatch, the first generation begins, starting the whole incredible process over again. We here in, in 
Indiana might be seeing the second or third generation since the monarchs have left Mexico. The spring monarch migration starts in March and lasts through June. The fall migration occurs August through November. During this time, monarch butterflies usually fly 50 to 100 miles per day, traveling at up to 30 miles per hour by soaring on the winds at high altitudes. The record is 265 miles in one day. I always like to think about Labor Day as being the peak of when the monarchs are coming through here. The whole month of September had a pretty consistent flow of monarchs through Indiana Dunes National Park. Monarchs face many dangers on their trip south, and they still face obstacles even after reaching their destination. Overnight temperatures can drop below freezing, and snow may even fall during their stay in Mexico. Fortunately, since monarchs are a cold-blooded insect, they don't require much energy in cold temperatures, and they will eat very little in order to save their food reserves. They can only fly in temperatures of at least 55 degrees Fahrenheit. During January and early February, many monarchs can die due to low temperatures that dip below 17 degrees Fahrenheit. 50% of monarchs won't survive in these conditions, and only 10 to 20% will survive if they become wet. There's been a documented decline in overwintering populations in Mexico. If the coverage of Mexico gets down to a certain area, that was equivalent to quasi-extinction. According to those models, we were very close to potentially losing this migration phenomenon. And there's weather events such as bad ice storms that have killed off a lot of the monarchs in Mexico. Temperatures that are too warm can be dangerous as well. In their dormant state, monarchs can retain the nutrients they need to survive, but warmer weather can cause them to burn through their food reserves too quickly. That can be bad because they'll find themselves too far north. They'll outrun their food resource. Cooler weather ahead of the monarchs as they get into southern Texas is good because that keeps the monarchs there in southern Texas where the milkweed has emerged and grown up. Luckily, the Oyamo forests in Mexico can protect the monarchs from sharp temperature changes by acting like a blanket. If the forest is thinned or cut down, the monarchs won't be protected. Monarch butterflies face even more hazards when migrating. Luckily, the monarch has developed a potentially deadly defense to discourage hungry hunters. The milkweed that sustains the caterpillars contains toxins, which makes their skin toxic and unpleasant to taste. Scientists theorize this may be the reason the viceroy butterfly so closely resembles the monarch. The viceroy is a slightly smaller butterfly, and if you look closely, you will see a telltale black line running along the bottom of the viceroy's wings that isn't present on the monarch. The similarity might be just enough to confuse predators that have learned to avoid eating the foul-tasting monarchs. But this defense is not a perfect solution, as predators like the praying mantis can withstand the toxins or can avoid eating the butterfly's skin. There you go. There's, there's that milky stuff. It's almost like a, a glue. It's poisonous. That's why the, the caterpillars, when they eat that in, inside their bodies, then it, it's a defense mechanism. It, it helps them. A bird or something might eat one of the caterpillars, but it probably won't eat one again. The weather poses an even greater danger. Wind and rain can prevent the monarchs from flying and force them to shelter in trees. In 2002, a rainstorm combined with low temperatures killed an estimated 250 million monarchs in Mexico. Because the tree cover is so vital for migrating butterflies, deforestation can be deadly for the monarchs that need the forest to survive stormy conditions. One of the things that we're trying to do with our education programs is to recognize that by planting just a few milkweed plants in your front yard, you're helping that those monarchs on their journeys as they migrate or in, in, as part of their life cycle. That can really have a large impact. The fate of the monarch butterfly is like the canary in the coal mine for us as a human species. If we can't take care of our fellow beings on this planet and we can't help and we can't live with them, we're not going to be able to live here either. Consider supporting or creating your own monarch way stations to aid these fragile insects along their epic journey. A simple way to start is by planting native plants that are best for butterflies and other pollinators, and by avoiding pesticides and herbicides in your own home garden. You can even apply to have your yard certified as an official way station at monarchwatch.org. If you have a sandy dry yard, you have Asclepius amplexicollis, this clasping leafed milkweed. You have Sullivan's milkweed, which looks like the common milkweed, but it has bigger flowers, it has a, a nicer looking structure, and it's not aggressive. So there's a lot of options you can have. You can still have the, the milkweeds that you love, the Asclepius that you love, you can still have your monarchs, but you don't have to have the aggressive plant. 
that uh, could become a problem in your landscape. Scientists from the USGS worked on a model to um, understand how much milkweed do we need to put out onto the landscape in order to enhance monarch populations and sort of take the monarch populations out of an extinction danger zone. This requires all hands on deck. So in other words, it's not gonna be like, the National Park Service is gonna put 1.3 billion more stems of milkweed. It's gotta be everybody participating. Another way you can help monarchs is by reporting observations. The more we know about these amazing insects, the more we can advocate for their survival and for the maintenance of the habitats they need. Scientists have been busy with this effort to learn more, and researchers are currently tracking monarchs to analyze their behavior. They do this by attaching small tags on their wings with a tag number that can be entered into a website. The Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program incorporates uh, measurements of milkweed abundance. This will roll out to um, park visitors, for example, or park volunteers who will um, actually do the, the surveying and the counting that goes along with the integrated monarch monitoring program. That'll include counting plants that are important to the monarch and also counting monarchs in their various life stages, eggs, caterpillars, and adults. We can all raise our voices to speak out on behalf of the monarch. Share what you have learned through blogs, social media posts, and op-eds. If you want to take your advocacy a step further, consider writing to your local state representative and encourage them to support legislation that directly protects monarchs and their habitat. There are also a number of nonprofit organizations working to preserve the crucial Oyamo forests in Mexico and support migrating colonies. Learn more at our website. The story of the monarch is one of remarkable transformation and perseverance against incredible odds, and we have a crucial part to play in telling the monarch's tale and in making sure it endures for generations to come. <laughs>